All right, I don't have PowerPoint today. I'm really ringing today for some reason all of a sudden. Uh, Colin, do you mind turning down wireless, my wireless 5 just a little bit? How's that? Everyone can still hear me? Okay, that's better. A little less of an echo. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service and some of the hymns and readings uh, that, we, that we heard and sang, uh, celebrate what some call Michaelmas. Not to be confused with Christmas. Michaelmas literally means the Mass of St. Michael. And what do we know about St. Michael? Anyone? Anything? Sure. Leader, commander of the angels and the angelic armies. And Bruce knows that because he read it this morning in our reading, so he, he, was, playing a, he was cheating a little bit. Uh, but yes, Michael is known, and tradition holds him to be the commander of the Lord's armies. And so we find him in the reading from Revelation, leading the Lord's armies against uh, Satan or Lucifer and his followers. Now the book of Revelation, in which we heard from today, in which the story comes from, depicts a heavenly realm that's beyond this earthly realm where angelic beings defeat evil and where all living creatures are bound up in eternal worship of God and there's beautiful imagery of that if we were to read through this book. Now the idea that there is a heaven sort of up there or, or out there uh, has greatly impacted our world especially for those of us living in the West. On the positive side, we are reminded that we, like the angelic messengers of God in Scripture, remembering, of course, that angels throughout Scripture are quite often giving the words of God or messages from God, we know that we are called, like them, to bring good news to the world. The word that this world is not all that there is can bring hope to us when we're overwhelmed with all that life throws at us. John, who is the author of the book of Revelation, was, after all, writing to a group of Christians who were enduring great suffering and persecution, arrest and even torture for their faith. And his work, this book of Revelation, is principally one of hope. But despite how things might appear right now, in the end, heaven wins. One day evil will be defeated, every tear will be wiped away, all peoples from all nations around the globe will be united in blissful worship and adoration of our Creator. Unfortunately, I believe there is also a flip side to belief in a heavenly realm. Many have used belief in an afterlife as justification for an apathy towards matters of social and ecological justice. On our continent, one of the greatest societal sins that we are grappling with has been the systemic mistreatment of the indigenous peoples of our land. I believe that many Anglicans involved in the residential school system had good intentions. Generally speaking, we believe Christianity brings good news to people who have never heard it. But sometimes we have allowed our convictions to justify disrespecting or even demonizing indigenous culture and spirituality. We have deemed our religion more sophisticated and advanced, and historically speaking at least, it has justified the implementation of systems bent on removing the spirituality, language, and culture of indigenous children. In a joint statement this week, our primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, Linda Nichols, and indigenous bishop Mark MacDonald write this. The wrenching legacy of residential schools is felt not only by those who survived, it lingers in the pain of families whose child died while at school. It lingers in the agony of not knowing why they died or where they are buried. It lingers in the inadequate record keeping that does not tell the cause of death. It lingers in the neglect to even record the names of almost one third of those who died. For a parent, the death of a child is an unimaginable pain. On September 30th, tomorrow, a first list of known names will be publicly released by the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation at a ceremony in Ottawa at the Canadian Museum of History. Releasing these names may bring relief at the public acknowledgement of this family pain. 
but it may also open wounds of grief afresh. While publishing the names may honor the children, the act of doing so is another public reminder for every family of the legacy of residential schools paid by the Indigenous people across Canada. They go on to add, the Anglican Church of Canada stands with the families and communities in sorrow. Sorrow for the preventable deaths of children in our care. Sorrow for every family that unwillingly released their child to a residential school, expecting them to be cared for, only to be told the child died, and for the most part, no body ever returned. The reasons for how and why these things happened are many and complex. But I do think that in some way, an overemphasis on belief in heaven can influence or at least demotivate justice activity. For if suffering people, in this case indigenous children, will one day die and go to heaven, do we really need to work hard at eliminating racism and alleviating their current trauma? Isn't it enough that we bring them a gospel that teaches them that all they have to do is believe in Jesus and join the church and one day they'll go to heaven where they can escape the horrors they've experienced in this life? Now perhaps I'm oversimplifying here and maybe none of us here in this room today will think this way. Probably none of us would at least speak this way. But I strongly believe that this, what we might call Christian Gnosticism, continues to have a significant influence today. Another example of this at work. There are many in the far right in particular claiming Christian convictions but who deny climate change and who even deem creation care either as unnecessary, since God's going to destroy the earth and beam us all up to heaven one day anyways, or they see it as a kind of pagan worship of nature. Maybe none here, again, believe this way, but there are many out there who do. Just look at the disturbing reactions to the teenage hero Greta Thunberg. as She gains international attention for her work in inspiring and mobilizing students to protest global warming. Many of us here have seen clips of her provocative and brave address to the UN. You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty worms, words, she says. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Now responses to her and her work have included mocking her physical appearance by none other than you know who, mocking her mental state, she has been diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum, and even her age. And I saw an internet meme going around this week that inferred that she and her generation should not be listened to until they have jobs. <laughs> These responses reveal more about the people uttering them than they do about Greta, I believe. And I marvel at her courage to carry on in her brilliant but simple way of speaking the truth. I loved when she turned our obvious priority on financial systems into a hopeful message about changing our ways when she said, if we can save the banks, we can save the world. I am grateful that there are signs that we are finally waking up to the climate crisis. And I'm extremely grateful for people like Greta who are rallying millions and speaking bravely to politicians. I'm also encouraged to be part of a faith tradition that now includes a commitment to creation care right in our baptismal liturgy and where many bishops, clergy, and laity participate in things like the climate march here in the city held on Friday. But we have a long way to go. And we here today need to be discerning in how we can contribute to the positive change desperately needed in our world. How do we navigate these difficult waters? And how might our faith actually speak to these burning issues? A few quick thoughts I'd like to share with you arising from our scriptures today. The first is this, and this comes from our gospel reading today. The incarnation. The incarnation is our belief that God became flesh and blood in Jesus of Nazareth. The incarnation definitively proves that matter matters to God. Matter matters to God. 
In the Gospel reading, Jesus tells Nathanael that he will see Jesus with angels ascending and descending upon him. This imagery speaks to Jesus' unique place as the mediator or the bridge between heaven and earth. In Jesus, we find the Word made flesh. In Jesus, we hear God's definitive Word that God creates, God loves God's creation, God enters God's creation in order to heal and restore it. God's creation is good. Belief in heaven or angels does not diminish the dignity and value of the earth. Quite the opposite, in fact. In Jesus, we see God's intent on sanctifying or making holy creation. And as little Jesuses, that's what the word Christian means, we too are called to safeguard the integrity of the earth. Secondly, in the passage from Revelation, we are shown contrasting tactics by the evil one and those of the kingdom of heaven. Contrasting tactics. The devil, or Satan, or the dragon, as referenced in Revelation, is called the deceiver of the world. The deceiver. Evil comes to power principally through deception. In particular, the deceit that we are all that matter. Deception that exalts the self is of the most seductive kind, for it can justify nearly every action. If we are the center of the world, then why can't we do what we want to do? Evil would deceive us into thinking that we are the masters of our own lives, and that we can do whatever we wish with this planet. Deceivers blatantly reject the truth when it does not suit them, building a narrative of lies and half-truths in order to inoculate masses to the crises we are facing as a human family. Evil then launches into a second effective tactic, accusation. Revelation calls Satan the accuser of our comrades who accuses the saints day and night before our God. Accusing the saints are the children of God day and night before God. The term Satan actually has its roots in the courtroom. It's the image of a prosecutorial figure or a prosecuting lawyer. Our minds might conjure up scenes from films or television where a particular animated and vicious prosecutor, uh, perhaps with that southern accent, uh, tears apart witnesses on the stand in order to paint a villainous image of the accused. You see, a favorite tactic of the evil one is to tear down and accuse those who would oppose him, to deflect away responsibility and blame and to point it somewhere else. Truth doesn't matter here. Ad hominem arguments are brought to the fore where it is the person and not their position that is under attack. And the fruit of this work, of this evil, is to elicit feelings of guilt and worthlessness. Guilt, as opposed to conviction, brings us down in order to keep us down. It makes us feel powerless and helpless to change or to do good. We are reminded of all our failings and the, maybe even the worst things we've done in our lives, and we are brought low. A conviction, in contrast, is an openness and a response to the truth, a heartfelt response to the truth that moves us to speak and act differently. And that brings me to the two tactics employed of the kingdom that resists evil. So again, evil, deception, accusation. But the kingdom of heaven, again, we find language of the courtroom used by John. But they, the saints of God, have conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Let's talk about the word of their testimony first. From its earliest days, the Jesus movement found strength and power in the sharing of their faith stories. When we hear about the activity of God in each other's lives, we are strengthened and nourished 
When we hear one another's stories, we come to discern a common theme. God's Spirit is alive and active in each and every one of us. We are all precious to God. We all matter to God. And being open and authentic with one another fosters meaningful human connection that helps us to understand one another and can help us chart a path forward with heightened sensitivity and wisdom. Our testimony is powerful. It recalls the continued activity of God in our lives, not just one event a long time ago, but the continued work of God in us, with us, and through us. Our testimony can build faith in one another, in our church, and ultimately in God. And it can inspire us to carry on, to keep going in God's kingdom activity. Now at the heart of our stories is the love of God. And that love is pictured in Revelation in the phrase, the blood of the Lamb. I know that sounds like a strange phrase for our modern ears, but it's referencing God's sacrificial love for us. Blood, remember, is the scriptural symbol of life. It was believed to be where all life came from in the human, be- in the human anatomy. Jesus becoming the Lamb of God represents God's self-sacrifice and the length God goes to for God's creation. The saints of old and the saints of today cling to the love of God and the power of God displayed through Jesus' death and resurrection. There was an old tune that I grew up on, perhaps some of you know it. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. It sounds strange to me even to say it or sing it today, because we don't use this language all that often. But these words speak of the hope that we have in Christ. They remind us that as people of the kingdom, we recognize evil's tactics of deception and accusation, and we resist evil in all of its forms by clinging to Christ and by speaking God's truth to power in our lives and in as a community together. So today, I would encourage you and all of us to renew our commitment to join with Michael and the angels and all the company of heaven in resisting evil in all of its forms, to be adamant in our pursuit of justice, to respect the dignity of every human life, and to strive to safeguard the integrity of God's creation, to respect, sustain, and renew the life of the earth. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we conclude our time with you this morning, We are grateful to have this place to come to in a storm-ridden world. Lord, as a nation, as we seek a path forward of justice and healing between Canadians of all stripes and colors and the indigenous peoples of this land, be with all those gathering tomorrow in Ottawa. Lord, much sadness and sorrow will be Renewed, but we pray also that there be a renewal of hope and the peace and justice and the good work being done to help families come to know where their children lie at rest. Thank you for our own Nancy Hearn and for her great work in this project and as she continues to help teach and educate us in these matters. Lord, we pray that we continue to grow in our awareness of how our actions are affecting this planet. Lord, for those of us who have put off concern for the planet because we've been overly concerned with heavenly things, or we've simply not cared enough about future generations to take it seriously, please forgive us. 
Help us in the way forward for each of us to be mindful of how we can fulfill our own baptismal covenant to renewal and sustaining this earth. Lord, make us mindful to discern evil in all its forms. And Lord, may we continue to be citizens of your kingdom that cling to the blood of the Lamb, your love, and continue to grow in sharing our testimonies with one another. We pray all these things in the name of Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. Let us stand for our closing hymn.